the task of conserving all of these artifacts, you know, imagine and documenting and maintaining a database and photographing. We don't take just one photograph. This bottle is photographed from all angles. If it has a pontal, which was an earlier method of actually ultimately shaping the lip of the bottle, then that's documented as well. But going back to the spigot, we recovered many, hundreds of things. And again, this was just on the ocean floor with images of them lying one by one, so their wooden crates clearly eroded away, and what was left was this interesting cargo. Probably intended for a barrel for either wine or beer, or perhaps even something as boring as water. And then this is um, the Holloway's ointment pot. And again, Holloway was extremely successful. So these guys, they were smart. They were making products and they were selling them. And I guess the idea being that there were no stipulations, they could do basically whatever they wanted. And if they wanted to poison you with their morphine and their cocaine and whatnot, they could. They were, they were, they were at will to do so. This bottle, being a beer bottle, um, the black glass was key. You know, without refrigeration, um, shipping. Beer was a big thing. A lot of beer was being made in the United States, but a lot was being shipped from Great Britain. Having a black glass, which was innately strong because of the minerals, the particular minerals, the black glass was ideal for preventing breakage, for, ma for maintaining the, um, the carbonation in the beer and for other um, products as well. Someone may ask me, why do we try not to trip here? Why do we keep some of the artifacts unconserved? When we first started recovering bottles, um, I had a bunch of bottle collectors and uh, bottle historians telling me that I should, we should tumble them, we should throw them into a tumbler and get them all clean and make them look pristine. And that was exactly what we didn't want to do. What we really wanted to do was make sure that we maintained the semblance of what we call the shipwreck effect. So that people could, when I go to schools, when I do presentations, that people can actually see that, you know, this is what, this is what these things look like when they come from the ocean floor. We have conserved many of the coins. Uh, excuse me, of the spoons, um, all of the coins, uh, but many of the spoons. But again, in this case, it just shows you the packing arrangements that these um, that these items came in. They were stacked, and they have since concreted together uh, over time. In some cases, we recovered uh, metal files, again, building materials, in large quantities, and we actually have the wax paper that was used to wrap the artifacts, and that somehow managed to maintain a semblance of, um, of uh, visibility over you know, nearly 140 years. And this last piece, and I asked the layout, we had um, both brown and white. It's kind of hard to tell what this is, but this is a doorknob, a porcelain doorknob. I asked them for one of the brown ones, which are really, really pretty, they're a marbleized brown. And what they proceeded to do is give me a white one, which still has some of the brown. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get back to them and give them a piece of my mind. But needless to say, um, again, not just one doorknob, but several hundred. You know, so the question is, you know, <laughs> leaving them on the seabed so they're destroyed, or bringing them up and being able to document them and tell the story, present them in exhibits, write about them, learn about the history. And it sounds simple, but many people didn't know what doorknobs were made of. I mean, it took me a lot of time to, to learn that these were porcelain. Um, so it's, it's these little pieces of information that, you know, we want to make available to the public and to share with you. Any more questions?